Hi everybody and welcome to Smack Talk. My name's Rich and joining me today we have a beguiling, bewitching and well bloody dangerous lady. You'll have seen her wrestling under many names and in many places and in many guises. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the one, the only, the infamous Katerina. My lady, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. <laughs> I feel very flattered and honoured. It's it's becoming a thing um, every time now. It's just these are getting more and more inflated. So I kind of oh, no, it wasn't just for me. So, so I should feel special. Well, you should because that one was, <laughs> that one was just for you. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, we um, obviously you have wrestled in many places and uh, the many many guises, and we don't need to to cover your beginnings because that's well documented as we've talked about. But. Uh, where have you been recently? Because last time we saw you on television was at Impact. Yes. Well, I just uh, finished off a the new season of Wow. So we just taped in May, um, which was super awesome fun. And also I think it's going to be a really great show. So that's exciting. We filmed in downtown LA, um, packed crowd, a red hot crowd, as they say. And... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just obviously being there, you know, waiting for my match or after my match watching. I have to say that it's just a really good production, you know, and I think people will really enjoy it. There's some really kick-ass women wrestlers on there, some really great gimmicks, great characters, you know, some really cool storylines, and, you know, the wrestling is good, and it's just it's shot so well. So I'm just I'm excited about that. I'm not sure when it will you know, come out, but obviously we'll keep people posted. But that's a really great experience. It's, it really is a fantastic promotion. I actually got into watching it because of you. Um, because I'd heard you were on the on the show and I just thought, oh, I've got to check this out. Uh, well, thank you. It's, no, it's a pleasure, honestly. It's a brilliant, brilliant show. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. It's it's fantastic. Um, as far as women's wrestling goes, it really showcases it in a, in a way that not many promotions are doing. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and then um, in addition to that, I'm doing some other independent shows, you know, all around the country, you know, Hood Slam in Northern California, which is a really super awesome fun. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's just a, a lot of really over-the-top characters. Uh, it's 420 friendly. Is that how you say it? <laughs> we can go with that, yeah. Uh, I'm encouraged, uh, for example, one of the tag team is the Stoner Brothers. Nice. You know? And then uh, we just have a lot of really out there characters. We have Serial Man, who's a superhero with a serial cotton on his head. You know, (laughs) we have some gender bending. We have, you know, the host, who's AJ Kirsch, who has created a character, you know, Joseph Brody, Bro Joseph Brody, um, who's really cool over the top. And it's just a really fun show. Um, yeah, I list all of the promotion and then, you know, obviously some down here as well. And I'm traveling around the world. I'll be back in the UK in November. That just happened. So I should maybe just uh, mention that real quick on November 24th in Cardiff, of all places. Nice. You actually must have read my mind just then because I was literally going to say, are you coming back to the UK anytime soon? And there you are. Yes, this just surfaced. So I'm very excited about that. That's awesome. Well, I, I look forward to seeing you back on UK shores, that's for certain. And uh, huh. I've never actually been to Cardiff before, so it's another excuse to go somewhere new. Fantastic. <laughs> so, now in, in the intro, as we mentioned, you are, well, very bloody dangerous, because uh, in the course of my research, I noticed how viciously you shut down interviewers in the past that have really sort of ticked you off. Um, <laughs> it may, Well, I, I noticed a couple. <laughs> Who did I shut down? So there was well, there was this one guy who prefaced the question about um, like taking a bump in the ring and saying how it, how much it would have hurt. Like he just goes, "So you're a woman," and then goes into it. And I just, I saw the look on your face. I was like, I'd have shot him the same look because it was so yeah. loaded. Well, that's what happens when you you know discriminate. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. and. <laughs> and there was this other other guy who was asking about Taylor Hendricks had kissed you in a match and did you enjoy it and all this stuff. And it was like, I mean, what came, what came through my head was, you know, do you find that a lot of interviewers and members of the media tend to go for that lowest common denominator style of questioning rather than just simply focusing on your obvious talent? 
Yeah, I think, you know, there's still, I mean, it's going to take a while still for, you know, women in this kind of a sport to be normalized. Um, mm. And there's still just a lot of excitement, I think, about, you know, when you have a male journalist, they just get excited maybe talking to a woman and they just, they just blurt it out without thinking perhaps or they haven't really you know, understood themselves that it's not, you know, a question of gender, you know, in, in these kinds of spaces. But I, I also, I've experienced it in other, you know, forms of entertainment as well. Like if I'm just talking to somebody and I, you know, tell them about my writing and directing and they go, oh, good, we need more women writers, and directors. And I'm like, I don't think you understand that that's still being patronizing because I don't consider mm -hmm. myself a woman writer-director or a woman wrestler. I consider myself a wrestler and a writer-director, but I just happen to be a woman. You know, I never, I didn't grow up, you know, with that much consciousness of, around my gender. You know, when I was little, when I was a kid, I very much was, you know, a tomboy, like I guess a lot of us wrestlers probably were. But... I just found myself, I just did things that I enjoyed. I didn't think about whether I should do them because I'm a girl or whether, you know, I should do them without, because I'm a boy. You know, it didn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference when you're a kid and you're playing what gender you are. So why does it make a difference to people now? Well, that's, you know what I mean? yeah, exactly right. Um, and you see, you know, especially like in AEW now and, and other companies that are, and Lucha Underground pushed for a while for intergender wrestling and, you know, there's talents like Sonny Kiss that have come through that are absolutely just phenomenal talents. And you watch you watch them work and at no point you're thinking, my God, that's a woman or my God, that's a, a homosexual man or a, a transgender man or any of that stuff. You, it right. just goes right out of your head because wrestling is for everybody. It's universal, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I mean, what I mean we, sorry, go on. So I do understand on some level as well, because um, obviously there's a debate about, you know, intergender and what people think about it. Right. You know, what I want to say I 100% disagree with is when people say that it in some way um, promotes domestic violence, which, mm -hmm. which I think is ridiculous because wrestling doesn't promote violence. Right. You know, it's like, it's like a showcase, but it's not, it doesn't make it's not designed to make people go out and want to fight each other. So why does that mean that if a woman and a man fight each other, that specifically promotes domestic violence if the rest of the show doesn't promote violence? Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? It does, yeah. It makes absolute sense. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm someone who, and I don't mind saying this, I'm actually someone who's witnessed first-hand domestic violence and been a victim of it as a man. And right. that doesn't often get talked about. You know, right. like you, you hear about men beating women and this sort of thing, and that's the general consensus behind the people who are anti intergender wrestling is like, oh, it'll encourage men to beat women up. But then yeah. you don't ever hear about the other side of that coin where men are getting, you know, it's more emotional abuse than than physical. But yeah. I'm someone who was a victim of a physical attack, um, mm -hmm. a domestic attack, and. It was really shocking, but at no point have I ever likened it to intergender wrestling because it's something completely different. Right. It's a sports contest, you know, in, in for want of a better phrase. You know, wrestling mm -hmm. is a quote unquote sport. So right. you you know, you have I, I don't know, I mean it's such a complex issue, but trying to simplify it down, you have certain sports where everyone is on an equal playing field. And yeah wrestling is such that you can be on that equal playing field regardless of size and strength and you know those sort of characteristics like you take a match where Rey Mysterio for example fights the big show right you've got one guy who's five foot something and tiny you know well I say tiny he's pretty muscular for a guy his size and the big show is seven foot you know right. massive the world's largest athlete and no one would ever say oh there's no way he could he could yeah. beat the big show Right, 100%. So why that being is that said, just to, be, uh, just to be a devil advocate here, okay. yeah. there are, like you said, there are some sports, however, where genders are separated mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily, you know, in a fighting contest or like, a, you know, dependent so much on maybe size and strength, for example, like basketball or football or whatever. So I do believe that if you are running a wrestling promotion and you choose to separate it because within the confines of the world that you are creating mm -hmm. in your sport, the genders are separated, 
I think that's a valid choice to make. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's wrong. You know, if that if you as a promoter prefer to keep them, you know, separate because that's in your world you've designed this. You know, that's how you've designed your sport. Then I think that's perfectly valid. Yeah, yeah. But you also the you. You know um, that there are size differences. So, especially like in professional, because obviously, if you go to UFC or somewhere like that, it makes even more sense because there's weight classes, so it's more even in terms of size and strength. And, and gender does play a role in that. I do mm. believe that. Um, but in wrestling, obviously, like you said, if Rey Mysterio can fight the big show, you know, then I can fight. I don't know. Name somebody. Well, whoever you want. <laughs> Cena. <laughs> yeah, and and that would be totally believable, right. you know. Right. I mean, we've seen um, what was it in Lucha Underground? Ivelisse, I think. Oh no, it was Taya. Taya had a match with Cage, and well, that yeah, was I mean, one of the greatest was, matches they had. It was a really great match. Mm. Um, yeah, well, they have a lot of you know, like Ivelisse as well. I mean, a lot of intergender matches in there. But then again, like within the confines of their world, it, the way they've set it up, it works a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, completely you know? right. So I Whereas think, I can see that in some other promotions where it's traditionally separated, that it might be, you know, might not work within that world to, you know, suddenly, you know, blur the lines for no reason. Sure. So it's more if it's in keeping with the promotion and the story arcs that they're generating. Yeah, because I feel like, because it's like a show, right? I mean, if you're watching a TV show or, or a film... You know that it's not real and it could be anything you want. You would, you believe, you know, let's take the Avengers, you believe that there's people flying through the air. Mm-hmm. But if you're watching a film that's basically completely based in reality and all of a sudden somebody is flying it through the air just because it makes sense for a plot point, then yeah. you kind of go, ah, it doesn't make sense and it takes you out of it. Yeah, completely agree. Absolutely spot on with that. Um, so it could be the same in wrestling that if you set up the world to where it's men wrestle men and women wrestle women and then all of a sudden unless it's a very specific storyline or a very specific thing you know or a specific person like china for example Mm -hmm. who can you know who can walk across those boundaries because she was so very different and unique you know then you might go oh why are they doing that now yeah and and i'm glad you brought china up because that's obviously um someone who is really a figurehead of this entire uh, movement in a way you know she mm-hmm. did blur lines and, and won the intercontinental championship and yes. you know she entered the royal rumble and mm-hmm. a fantastic performer and obviously right. got her pseudo entry into the hall of fame this year and i use the word pseudo entry because she was part of a, a, a faction yes how much would it mean to yourself as a, a women's wrestler or, or well wrestler in general um yeah. To Good see I, I, I remembered where we were. <laughs> but just in general terms, um, how much would it mean to you to see her going to the Hall of Fame on her own? I, I just think that she absolutely 100,000% should. I think she deserves that because I think she is bigger than being a part of the faction. It's nice, for, but, you know, and there's other wrestlers that have gone in as part of a faction and on their own. I think she should mm-hmm. definitely go in on her own. And I feel like they, they might well still do that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with I that. They were just wary of it, you know, for certain reasons. Of course. Well, she was still, still alive, to be honest. But I'm hoping that they, they will still do that for her. Yeah, I mean, the reaction it got was amazing. The, mm. You know, when her face came up on the screens, the, oh my God, I've never yeah. ne- never heard something like it. You know, it well, was, everyone was unanimous in their support. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that's very telling of how the world has changed now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we are now in a world that is completely different to back in the Attitude Era days, where people do seem to either latch onto something in a big way or get mm. massively offended by it. And there doesn't seem to be any grey area. <laughs> you mean now or then? Uh, well, more so now, I believe. Um, I think back then there was a lot more freedom to express yourself, whereas now you can express yourself, but sometimes people will take it the wrong way. Um. Yeah, but I feel also just, yeah, we've come into an era where people are more aware. True. So people are careful 
you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. I know a lot of people, you know, want to want to say, oh, you can't say anything now. Well, you can, but maybe you just have to look at what you are meaning to say more carefully. Yeah. You know, some words that people would want to use, and they like, I can't say that. Well, maybe then it just needs to go away. Yeah, you that's, know, that's a very good point. Point. We can We can be more creative and go, come up with better words for things if that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a, a strange thing when people are so protective of words that are really just nonsensical mm-hmm. mumblings, aren't they, really? They're nothing, you know, in the grand scheme yeah. of things. Language evolves, and so we need to evolve with it. Right, right, exactly. Oh, we got we got way deep on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think it's important to talk about these things, you know, and, and as you've said as well in, in the past, like, it's... If you, if you talk about these things, it, it brings it to the table and it lets people open up ideas. And once that happens, we get past all the name calling stuff and all the, you know, the the basic elements of it. And we can actually generate a discourse and, and create something really cool. So, so in that vein, obviously you're best known for your wrestling, but you're a massively accomplished actress. And um, I think I'm right in saying you're also a lover of movie trivia. Am that, I? <laughs> have I uh, have I hit upon something there, or am I barking? <laughs> that surprises me, but <laughs> go ahead with what you were going to uh, <laughs> say. Well, you were you going to trivial questions? <laughs> well, I, I I would test you on your trivia, but I feel like I'd be um, losing this battle because <laughs> I've yeah, because apparently you were wrong. And <laughs> well. <something> you- <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I ask about this is because I've always been a huge fan of Elvira and I have also been a massive fan of Katarina's Nightmare Theatre. Oh, and I love it. I th- you were a huge part of my watching of wrestling throughout your time in WWE mm. and onwards from there into Impact and so on. And to have discovered that not only were you a wrestler that I really enjoy watching, but a massive movie buff <laughs> was just like the, it was like manna from heaven to me. So can you talk us through that? Like, how did oh, you... Oh, no, I'm just shouting you're a loser. <laughs> I do my research, trust me. <laughs> now, I hosted, yes, I hosted a bunch of classic horror movies. Yes. Um, DV Line, as you said, entitled Katarina's Nightmare <laughs> Theatre. Um, but what happened was, you know, the man from Scorpion Releasing, who releases these classic horror films on DVD, you know, re-releases, um, he contacted me and said he wanted to try something a little bit, you know, different, something fun, mm-hmm. he thought we would enjoy, it would be for me to host these films, Elvira style, yeah. not obviously her style, but just, you know, introduce the films, give some trivia, you know, talk the fil- about the film afterwards and things like that. Uh, so we did. So, and here's where maybe I'm disappointing you. I mean, I did watch the films. Okay. I definitely, I did watch every single one. I, you know, gave some thoughts, you know, to them. And I did enjoy, you know, them more than I probably expected to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't write all of the trivia. <gasps> I am <laughs> stunned by this. What? You didn't? <gasps> Oh my oh, god! Cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I was under the, do you know what, This is the you've almost broken my heart there because I I god. was doing the research and watching your YouTube channel and going through your videos and every I literally left no stone unturned for this. Oh no! And there was there was bits in your videos we were going and what film's that quote from and all this sort of thing. I'm like, my God. Yes, but like, this is very specific. See, if I do that, that's very specific films that I've seen a million times. Oh, okay. Like, for example, I will quote, I will quote, uh, Batman Returns yeah. relentlessly for no reason at all. Like, if if a phrase, you know, a quote from the film fits into something that's going on in my life, and I think it's funny, I will say it. Mm-hmm. Or, for example, I will quote Alan Partridge. And then I will I will laugh out loud because I'm popping myself so much, oh and it completely God. makes no sense and is completely relevant to everybody else, you know things like that. Or I'll quote uh, from American Psycho, the book, not the movie. Of course, it's an important distinction. Um, I will quote things that, in the context 
of the texts in the book and therefore in my head is hilariously funny. <laughs> but in real life, to the regular person, it's not funny at all. So that's when I say, oh, what is this quote from? This is because these are very specifically my very favorite films and books that I'm quoting. Right. And I wouldn't necessarily say that I am well versed, even though I enjoy films. Obviously, I'm a film buff and that I enjoy a lot of films and I do watch a fair amount. That's fair enough. I am. Um... I'm sorry that I broke your heart. I just, no, uh, no, you could never. No, it was just like, more. <laughs> it's more the the nerd in me was just like, oh my god, this is incredible. I need to ask her about this. And then... <laughs> no, I, just, uh, I don't know if I should have said. I, I wrote it. We were kind of maybe trying to present it as if I wrote it, but I, I don't enjoy lying, so I, I have know. to just change this then. <laughs> That's honesty is the best policy, and um, I, you know what was it you? Uh... Or, or as Judge Judy says, if you. Tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Now, that's a good one. I like that. Yes. Yeah. That's she is, I mean, I quote her as well a lot because I watch her a lot. It's, it <laughs> seems you quote the people worth quoting. Oh, I'm good. Well, thank you. I'm glad you feel that way. I do. And uh, there was the one about sitting on the fence, wasn't there? And uh, if you sit on the fence, the grass is always green from Lucky Number Slevin. Yes. There you go. What a fantastic movie that is. Great quote, too. I love that. <laughs> Oh, the script is like every single word in that script is meticulously crafted. You know, like it's just unbelievable oh. that film. I do you know what? I haven't watched it recently, but I oh, it was so good when it came out, and I've watched it. I can't so, think how many times. I think it gets the credit it deserves. It's mm. literally like a work of genius. Oh. I, what do you think of the Big Lebowski? Because that's probably my favourite film of all time. It's great. I mean, I've seen it a couple of times, mm. and I thought it was fantastic, but I don't necessarily, it's not a film necessarily that I personally, for no reason, yeah. um, don't necessarily wouldn't watch over and over. I think it's fair to say, though, that you tend to edge towards the um, the darker end of the scale. Mm. You know, because yes. um, you described yourself to Alicia Rattel as a sociopath in training. Right, yes. So are you still in training, or have you graduated now? <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is I, I still haven't been able to switch off my emphatic nerve. Ah. That's kind of the problem with that. <laughs> yeah, it's always the tricky bit. That's the tricky part. You know, you can... I'm all talk when it comes to that. I'll be like, yeah, I have a, you know, cold heart. You know, my blood runs cold, whatever. But it's not true, unfortunately, so... Oh. Well, I mean... <laughs> The fact that you're here talking to me says there's enough warmth in you to uh, pity, pity the lesser amongst us. So, <laughs> but, uh, I'm enjoying talking to you. Oh uh, well, uh, likewise too. And obviously, we um, we don't go all that far back. It was what's it been less than a year, I think, because um, mm. you know we met at WrestleCon uh, a couple of months back now. Yes. And, but prior to that, I'd. Uh, worked with you on the design of your Dorian Gray inspired shirt and eight by tens, and obviously that was based around your love of all things dark and twisted. Right. So, I mean, it was your concept. So, would you like to share your side of that with everybody? Because I've talked about it at great length to anyone that will listen, because I was so proud of it. But uh, I'd love to share your side. Well, it's just for me. I mean, the the picture of Dorian Gray again is like a hugely influential. Um, book in my life and I think a lot of people who either don't know it or just maybe read it once at school and don't really, you know, they think of it as a horror story but it's actually much more sort of a story of philosophy mm. you know, about life and it's actually, if you reread it you not you, I mean, not the specific you but like the general you people um, it's actually very current, like it doesn't age. Like the portrait, it doesn't age mm. because it's all about it's all about rethinking, you know, certain structures in society, for example. You know, it talks about, you know, for example, uh, romantic love and monogamous love, which is, you know, a subject that I'm very passionate about. Mm-hmm. You know, as in passionate, as in I, I don't necessarily philosophically believe in monogamy. Um 
that's like something that it talks about just but it, it makes you sort of think about structures of society and why they're there and why they're not what how they you know came about or why they're not necessarily you know needed or you know the right way to go or whatever so and also it's very much about living life to the full and dorian in the book does it to uh like does it to a degree where it turns evil where it turns bad mm. you know but the because he can get away like what is kind of like the question what would you do if you could get away with anything right and he basically does everything he can and gets away with it you know because of his beauty and so if anyone who doesn't know because maybe if some people in america are watching and not everybody know he, he knows the book apparently interestingly hmm. um the, the story of the book is basically dorian gray he's this young 21 year old maybe um beautiful blonde blue eyes like the you know the the beauty <laughs> ideal you know of western culture whatever um and he has his portrait painted and it's so beautiful and then his friend says to him, well, you know, once you lose your beauty, you, you know, life's not going to be so good for you, you know. And so he looks at the, the portrait and he goes, I wish that I could age instead of my portrait. And so that's exactly what happened. But not only does he age, but whenever he does something bad, like it shows up. Right. You know, it's painting like a, like a cruel twist of the lip or, you know, you know, speck of blood on his hand or something. Mm. So like portrait takes upon all the consequences of his actions and so because of that it just you know makes him go further and further so it's just this idea of you know like letting go and relentlessly just going after the passion of the moment and not thinking about the consequences and which i say is current because of the whole yolo movement you know <laughs> This whole, you know, be in the present and live life now. Mm. And so obviously that's doing it. You know, you want to do it obviously in a healthy, yeah. <laughs> in a healthy way, not in a to where it turns evil like Dorian. Exactly right. right. So that was kind of like the, but that's where my fascination with him comes from in a nutshell. <laughs> and so then our design was basically, is a picture of me um, where on one half I'm still, you know, young and pristine, as we would say. <laughs> and on the other half, it's like my face is like weathered and old and horrible, you know, and there's skulls in the background behind me and stuff. Mm. And you made on the on the picture frame, yes. even you ate half of it. And That's right. So, yeah, so it looks really cool. But it's kind of that, it's that double-sidedness. And then again, that um, maybe it does tie in with a sociopath thing for me, because I have this persona where in real life I do try and live, you know, a kind and emphatic life and um, try and do the right thing by people and, you know, honesty and all that stuff. But then I also have this inherent fascination with things that are evil, which I think most of us do have. And so that's kind of where, like, the duplicity, you know, comes in. Yeah, exactly. And it was, um, I've stated to yourself and to, to many people I've talked about that design too, that oh. aging you and essentially ruining your face was the hardest <laughs> thing that I've ever had to do. <laughs> it really was. It was awful because you, I kept, I kept sending you examples. You're going, no, you need to make it more old looking and all this. <laughs> I, was like, I can't do this. You have to show up. You have to see oh. But I'm I'm so proud of how it turned out, and it's it is probably the most unique thing I've done. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. No, thank you. And uh, I mean, you've obviously talked there at great length about Dorian Gray, and uh, you know the inspiration behind um, a lot of your work is great characters. And I believe you um, you said in the past that you got into wrestling more for the characters than for the actual wrestling. Yeah. So why I bring that up is that I feel that it clearly translates into your film work as well because having watched you know your recent films such as uh, Karate Kill and Sickness and mm -hmm. Redcon One, your characters are also varied and 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 they have such depth to them. So is there a particular character that you've portrayed in any of these films that stands out in your mind above the others? Uh, well, for me, I think Karate Kill. Mm. It's like number one, just because um, 
I mean, I play Simona in Karate Kill, and she's very vicious and sadistic and evil, but she also has, like, this fun side. When I say fun, she's not, like, necessarily fun to other people, but she takes, that like, great fun and pleasure in, you know, in... I call her gleefully sadistic. Yeah, that's not deadly she accurate. She does the torture, but then she's laughing the whole time because she enjoys it so much. Um... And I think for me, even though it's maybe a little bit of a cliche for me to play evil characters <laughs> at this point, um, but I really enjoyed it just because, well, for a start, because the whole film, the whole film is very, like, tongue-in-cheek, mm. you know? It's actually very funny. Like, it's kind of, even if you look at the poster, you know, it's sort of, it's like an homage to kind of B-movie, you know, action films, and but it's, it's done with humor, like it's supposed to have that kind of twinkle in its eye, you know? So I really enjoyed that. And when I watched the film, I laughed out loud, you know, several times. Um, and then just making the film was so great. Um, it's also, it's sort of, some of the scenery is like post-apocalyptic, uh, sorry, apocalyptic, and I'm wearing this, you know, like, leather contraption these little you know outfits i've got this eye patch and stuff and there's one scene where we filmed the whole thing ourselves like the actors we had helmets on and then we had gopros on the end of our helmets and we filmed the entire scene like there was no other camera in the room you know so that was a really unique you know experience as well and then um just the director karano mitsutaki he was so fun to work with, and he, he knew exactly what he wanted, but he also gave us so much freedom. So I think almost after every scene, and, and by the way, when I first got the script, mm. um, I know they, they needed me for like, I think it was seven days, and I read through the script, and I went, I'm not in this. You know, it was like one short dialogue scene, and otherwise it was a couple of times where I was mentioned in one sentence. I was like, what do they need me for? That? Like, I'm just walking around in the background a couple of times. But then when we actually shot it, um, because Karando had also written the script, so he just basically, you know, made the notes for himself kind of thing. Mm. But some of the scenes where it was just one line, you know, like Simona you know, I was torturing a girl and then the scene begins, right? Right. So I'm just thinking I'm in the background just torturing her a little bit and then the scene begins. But then my torture was like a whole several minute long scene kind of thing. And but it was all improvised. And then after every take <laughs> of all of those scenes, basically uh the note that we got from Karando was generally more, more <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like it was just like have fun with it go over the top this is not a serious you know thing like obviously we took it seriously yeah but it was really something where we could experiment and explore and that made it such a great experience and then i just really loved the film and i liked myself in it which isn't you know necessarily a given so yeah so that's actually one that i'm really proud of so i'd like to people to go to amazon now <laughs> and download it and watch it or you know obviously order the dvd just get as many copies as you can frankly i think right just absolutely. get every copy of everything yeah. and if you have one and you come see me at a show then i will obviously sign it for you there you go and you can't say fairer than that <laughs> so um, i mean i i got to ask though because you're talking there about improvising and torture and that kind of rings alarm bells for me because I'm thinking, well, how does the other actress feel? Like, you're there improvising torture scenes. You've got the director going, give us more. Come on, like, lop her arm yeah. off or something. It's like, <laughs> at what point do you go, well, hang on a minute? You know? <laughs> it's not real, Rich. <laughs> it's video. not? Really? Just... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I may have exaggerated for effect, but you know what I mean, right. though? Like, there's... Does, does well, the yeah, actress you're torturing know what's going to happen? Yeah, no, like any time, if there was like actual sort of, you know, I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Sure. But if there was like physical ailments included that required special effects or whatever, obviously that was very meticulously planned out mm -hmm. and rehearsed and choreographed because you can't, you know, you can't do it. Like anything that involved like fighting yeah, or that kind of physicality, 
was choreographed and rehearsed and we had an amazing stunt team uh and yeah so that was that was that was not a question of like just go out there and you know beat somebody up you know and, pre and pretend like it, you know it was that was very meticulous it was more like different kind of torture but you'll have to watch it and find out what that is yeah i i won't mention anything because i i have seen it but i don't want to spoil it oh, for anybody okay. either well, then, you know, i'm referring to probably oh yeah yeah emotional. i'm i'm very aware of that but i it's just wanted like to the emotional abuse yeah. <laughs> i just wanted to go down that sort of route of kind of the improvising thing because it fascinates me like I've, I've watched a lot of the um improvaganza stuff and whose line uh, do you, have, you, have you ever watched any of that sort of stuff or a little bit yeah, yeah. just it always has amazed me how anyone can just improv so quickly so yes. you know to to hear that you improvise a lot of that stuff you know now that i want when i go back and watch it again it's going to take yeah. on a whole new life for me so yeah. I, I mean literally the only scene that was scripted out like when i speak mm -hmm. the only thing that where i actually had scripted lines is that high noon type scene where i face the japanese because he had japanese yeah. lines and i had english lines and when we talked to each other that's the only scene where i actually had lines lines right and any other time that i speak i was just making it up that's fantastic well that my ha if i had a hat on it would be off to you right now because that's <laughs> absolutely amazing. you know what that line's from huh you know what that you know oh, says you, that you three. sneaked it you sneaked trivia in and i <laughs> wasn't prepared it's like number 11 see it's only a very few my very favorite oh. movies that well it's when they're taped to oh shit i'm sorry uh, don't want to spoil it. No, 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 go on. <laughs> well, but our listeners might not have seen it. Oh, all right, then tell me off, eh? It'll be fine. So, yes, yes. So, <laughs> uh, so, moving on from Karate Kill, um, yeah. you then did a film called Sickness, I believe. Is that right? Well, yeah, so I can't really talk about it yet. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> so, no more. We will. Uh... <laughs> Strike that from your we'll, list. We'll, we'll edit that out. Edit no, point. I can talk about it, like the experience of making it, but it's not It's not released anywhere, so people won't be able to see it. Got it. Okay, fair enough. Moving on. We, <laughs> we, can, we can talk about Redcon 1, though. Yes. Which, again, absolutely awesome film. Definitely go see that, because, my God, is that kick-ass. Um, you, <laughs> you are... Now, it's... Kira, and I can't remember the rank that you held. Is it Sergeant? Sergeant, There yes. we go, yes. Sergeant Kira, surname redacted for security reasons, or the fact that I didn't write it down. <laughs> Page. Page, there we go. <laughs> 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 I told you I'd been scrambling about on this thing, like, back and forth. And I t actually, for realism's sake and for the audience's sake basically i had a lot of extra notes that we went through before the interview and i had to wipe them and the surname accidentally got deleted while i was wiping those notes no. <laughs> so i apologize for that it's not a lack of um preparation it's just a lack of no. copy paste cut delete skills so uh, anyway oh. so redcon one yes you are in the midst of a zombie apocalypse yes and you play one of the most badass female characters I've seen on screen. What? I think Thank so. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else does, but I do. <laughs> it sounds like you don't. Like that's surpri your reaction surprises me. Mine? Yeah, like you seem surprised that I describe your character as badass. No, I mean she's badass. I just I wouldn't say she's one of the most badass women I've ever seen on screen. Oh, I don't know. I I see. I have perhaps different parameters for what makes a badass than most people. So yeah. I see someone with emotional depth as being more badass than someone who's just like a physical phenomenon. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. So, and again, spoiler free. There's a scene <laughs> where your interaction is one of the most emotionally jarring parts of that movie. Um how to best put it without sounding like I'm going down the salacious route you are less than dressed and soaking wet <laughs> and you are dealing with another character and that interaction between the two of you is so emotionally charged in a uh, it's, it's so full of pathos let's say that 
it really just opens the world of that film up in a new way. Well, thank you. It's, you've made my day saying that. Well, it's it's just the truth, and and the fact that I had to do some linguistic gymnastics to get around it without <laughs> spoiling anything was. <laughs> It's totally fine. So, I mean, obviously, I, I throw it to you now. Like, tell us about your role in that film and just, you know, what your experience of it was because it is something so different. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, it was an amazing experience. First of all, we got to be, you know, in mainly Scotland mm -hmm. and also in England. As you could see, we filmed some scenes in in London, right by Tower Bridge, for example, which was, you know, I was blown away that we got to, you know, that we got to be there and film there. Mm -hmm. um, it was an amazing, it was like, it was just amazing just being there for the, that was the longest time that I've spent on a film, because I was literally there for three months altogether. Wow. And, you know, it's a different experience when you're there, like you're probably there, like you're on set every day. You know, and everybody around you, you, you form really close bonds with and everything like that. And then you just watch everybody, you know, transform into their characters. And, I mean, it wasn't an easy shoot, you know, for, it was reasonably easy for me. But, like, in terms of, for example, you know, Oris, Oris Herrera, who plays the, uh, who plays um, Michael Stanton, the main, main lead character, I mean, he really worked so hard. You know, he was there every single day. And he just, he, you know, he gave so much to the role. Mm -hmm. And he just was so dedicated. And it was just so inspiring to watch. And, you know, obviously some of the others as well. And watching also, you know, Chi, the director, who was also producing it. And then one of the other actors, uh, Carlos Gallardo, who was... Um, the star in El Mariachi, which yeah. was Robert Vegas' breakout film. So he's in this, and he was also a producer on it. And Ioana, uh, um, Ioana was also a producer. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> uh, watching them, you know, put this together, and it was a decent sized budget for, for independent films, you know, certainly, definitely the biggest budget that I've been in. Um, but the way that they pushed this production and what they got out of it, you know, oh, and Mark Strange also was the producer and he's also one of the main characters. He did a fantastic job, by the way. Mm. Um, just watching them just squeeze out, you know, every drop of potential that they could, you know, out of the budget and their resources and, you know, out of us, you know, the actors and everybody in the crew, you know, that worked super, super hard. It was just really inspiring just to be, you know, just to be a part of that and just the dedication that everybody brought to it. Yeah, it's and it comes across on screen too. And as you mentioned with the lead characters, you know, and the actors that were portraying those, that yeah. every single person in their roles was so passionate about it. Like yes. that, that really comes through on screen. And you don't see that in a lot of... Um, I could you describe it as an independent film? I guess it is because it's yeah. not any film that's not made by the studio is still an independent film. Yeah, because it never felt like an independent film to me. You know, because it was so well put together, and yeah. you don't imagine that it is. It's like you see a lot of these um, films that come off as independents, and they have the real low budgets, and they're kind of really, yes. you know. That being said, though, Rich, in, there are some independent films that are multi-million-dollar films with big stars on them. This is independent. True means that they're not linked to a studio but yes. I do know what you mean you're, you're talking more about kind of like a grassroots kind of put yeah. together low level sort of you know I suppose, money yeah. kind of I suppose people like, and even myself included in this have a stereotypical view of what an independent film would be much like actually in wrestling right. people have a stereotypical view of what an independent wrestling company is so yes. you know yes. and do, you, uh -huh. do you find the two worlds link quite closely in terms of similarities or in terms of like crossover of work and kind of thing? Um, I suppose in the way of portrayal of characters and, you know, the... Because um, obviously you've, you've been on television with your wrestling in WWE and also on the big screen, you know, and, and 
in your portrayal of a character is is there much similarity in in wrestling and film or is it quite a different world i would say i mean there are similar similarities of course because you are you know you are building a character you're portraying a character and then depending on it all depends you know where where you work and who you work for and what that process is you know for example so i mean in wrestling you have instances where people have created their own character from the ground up and it's 100% their creation and then depending on what company they work for they might get more or less freedom to run with it or they might have some lines written for them or whatever but you also have instances where the role is basically written for you where you come in and they go okay so this is going to be your character and this is what you're going to say Mm -hmm. so but you have that I mean, I, you know, I had that, for example, when I came in as winter, Yes. you know, even though that I then, you know, it was then up to me, my responsibility how to dress her and things like that. And then, you know, I brought in some ideas too, but that was, you know, when I came in, it was like, Vince Russo said to me, okay, I have this character winter, this is blah, 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 this is what we're, the storyline kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, whereas maybe on the independent show, I would show up and I would be like, okay, so this is my character, this is my music. And then the promoter might decide whether or not he wants you to be a heel or face. Right. You know, but other than that, it's entirely your creation. So in films, usually it's more, you know, obviously you're you're slotting into a role that's already been written. You're auditioning for a role rather than bringing your own. But then you're always bringing part of yourself to it too. And then, like I said, in Karate Kill, for example, there was more freedom to explore you know, in terms of improvisation and stuff like that, whereas Redcon 1 was more, you know, she wanted very specific things from each character. So that's just a different a different way of working that you have on different, you know, different sets, different projects and things like that. And then um, there is a famous man in England, and I forget who he is, um, who works, he creates his movies based on his actor's improvisation. Do you know who I'm talking about? Oh. Is it Mike Leach? No. Is it? No, I don't... Th- the name escapes me. Uh, I know exactly who you mean. Um, yeah. And I can't yeah. remember. He's uh, definitely um, famous. And yeah, he's been some, like, a, you know, cinema films. Mm-hmm. And the movie theaters. But basically his... Um, his process is he'll get a group of, group of actors and they will get together and I don't know if he gives them scenarios or what, but they improvise all the scenes and then he writes the film based on their improvisation. Wow. Which is, yeah. which is obviously That's... very... And then they rehearse the, you know, the new lines and stuff like that, I guess. Yeah. And don't that... quote me exactly but yeah. that's kind of but that's a very different way of working than from what most people start with a set script and then they go okay who could fill this role the way that I envision it yeah and that's going to give you the more visceral more raw emotional states isn't it as well so and, I mean not necessarily okay. I don't think okay because I think you know I think <laughs> well because it's it's if you if you have the lines and it's uh a character that's well-rounded, like in the way that it's written, you know, I mean, you still fill in the blanks emotionally, I guess you know, so, yeah. late to your own experiences and, and you, you fill in sort of the, you know, the emotional depth yourself. So you can use somebody else's lines to express an emotion that you might genuinely have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I suppose, I mean, it's for me, I'm, I'm, in no way am I an actor so um and I've never had that training so I guess in the sense of from my perspective I see it a certain way that like may not be the same for yourself you know I and having been in that role and and experienced what it's like to improvise on a on a movie set so it really to me it's fascinating to hear your take because it's so enlightening to to techniques I wouldn't really have understood otherwise so um I'm very grateful for this (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, see, yeah, for me, it's like for, with improv, it's not necessarily wasn't always the easiest thing for me, or isn't necessarily the easiest thing for me. Some people can just things just spill out of their head, mm-hmm. you know. And then again, where you said similarities between acting and wrestling, that's another similarity to what some people 
can go in the ring and they find it easier to come up with a dramatic, you know, match in front of an audience in reaction to, you know, the, the vibe of the audience or whatever. Mm. Um, and then some people find it easier to choreograph and then, you know, go over it a million times. And then once it's really settled in their head, they know what to do, then they can fa- focus on the emotions. Right. You know, that would be mainly for me. I find that easier. But then for some people, it's like if they if they call it in the ring, then they are more connected to their emotions. So I think it just depends on the, the person. It's what, what process is easier for them. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that's awesome. And like, I, I mean, again, I have never experienced either of those worlds, really. So um, hopefully one day. I mean, I have taken yeah. a bump and have ref to match wow. so maybe one day I'll, um, <laughs> uh, join an improv group well, yeah that's not a bad idea um, it could be a very good place to start and yes. I, I mean would that be something you'd recommend to, to anyone like to that wants to necessarily you know get into acting or even into wrestling I recommend an improv class to anyone who wants to get into wrestling acting or none of those things like yeah. I just think in general, an improv class does so much to open you up, to like free you up, Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of just, you know, like we were talking earlier, being present in the moment, for example, which is something that a lot of people don't necessarily do, but just to be able to open up that way and just to feel free to be open in that moment and play, I think is, that's an amazing thing for anybody to do at any age. You know, and it's funny because we used to play improv games um, when I was a kid. We used to play improv games like, you know, with my friends, basically, just for fun, you know. And it was just, it didn't matter if it was good or bad. We just played it because it was, we enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. You know, and you just, you totally free, and you allow yourself to be totally free and to just come up with all kinds of nonsense and it doesn't matter. And then once we're adults, we're so incredibly afraid of improv right because we think oh what if i don't think of anything that's good you know so but that's where if you actually go and you take a class and you do it on a regular basis and you allow yourself to just to come up with nonsense even if it's bad you know it'll free you up and then at some point you'll go oh hang on i actually i'm not bad at this at all it was just it was something that you know was blocked or even if you're not good at it, it doesn't matter it's just it's just for the sake of playing. I think it's definitely a good thing to do. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I think we are, as adults, we get so focused on what other people think that we forget mm-hmm. about what we think is funny, you know, or what we enjoy. So um, we get caught up in the negatives far too often. Yes. And, uh, I mean, in that vein, I, I always like to round off these interviews on a positive. So um, is there anybody out there that you'd like to give a mention or shout out to that doesn't normally get one? <laughs> should have warned me about uh-huh. this <laughs> it's the killer question that's at the end of every one of my interviews <laughs> <laughs> um, huh. it can be Pixie your cat it can be anybody you know what? I'll, I'll shout out to my family because I don't really never interact they're not really on social media so I don't really interact with them on social media okay. so mm-hmm. I'll give a shout out to my mom and dad who were amazing parents and um, really taught me, you know, to be hopefully the, the one side of the person that I'd like to be, which is kind and general, uh, generous and um, honest. And then also my sisters, my elder sister Jessica, who is an actress in Germany, and my younger sister Leia, who I will see in Cardiff, hopefully, because she lives near there. Oh, nice. So, yes, and they're beautiful little families that they have as well. Oh, so shout out yeah. to my family. There you go. <laughs> See, I'd have been worried if you'd said that they taught you how to be a sociopath because that, <laughs> that could have been yeah, really that's, awkward. That's, oh, that's, I think that's where my struggle is because they <laughs> taught me the opposite. So I'm trying, you know, trying to work against that is difficult, as you know. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Well, just want to say thank you for joining me, Kat. It's been absolutely great to talk to you again and looking forward to seeing you in Cardiff and again on the big screen really soon. Um, Fantastic. So where can 
anyone that wants to keep up with you and your work uh, find you on social media? Okay, so all of my handles are basically Katarina's Infamy. Um, and that is K-A-T-A-R-I-N-A-S-I-N-F-A-M-Y. And that's Twitter, Instagram, and also my Facebook page. Nice. Keep it simple. And YouTube. So, yes. Yeah, that's uh, you are pretty uh, pretty easy to find. I'm not going to lie, because you're very unique in your presentations across social media. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's there's not many people out there as infamous as you. So, uh, no, that's that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> so, just once again, thank you to Katarina for joining us today. And um, nice to say, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at SmackTalk underscore UK, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Head over to SmackTalk.co.uk where you can support us by treating yourself to some awesome merch, including the delightfully infamous shirt we designed for Katarina exclusively. Any merch you do buy helps us continue to produce unique and diverse content. So all that's left to say is thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>